All right. So first of all, welcome to this talk. Thank you for being here. Uh, we are going to talk a lot about a lot of things in 20 minutes, well, 25 minutes. Um, but we want you to keep in mind two main things. So one of them is, what about if you want to migrate an existing product to the cloud native? So then this is your talk. Or even more, we are going also to teach you about our experience and what we did well and what we did wrong. So then you can improve and make it better. So my name is Natalia. I'm working at Adobe as a software developer engineer. And I love maths and coding in my spare time. And I'm Carlos. I'm a principal science, scientist also at the Adobe uh, Experience Manager. Um, my background is uh, open source a lot. And one of the things I did was starting the Kubernetes plugin. Well, thank you for having us here today. A quick introduction about Adobe Experience Manager so you have a better understanding of why we took some decisions. Uh, it's an existing distributed Java OSJ application. There was a bunch of Java developers out here. So uh, you will understand a little better what it takes to move Java to, to Kubernetes or Cloud Native. It uses a lot of open source components from the ASF. And we also contribute back to, to all the, a lot of open source projects that we use. And it has a huge market for extension developers that can write code on top of AM. And that kind of limits what we can do. Uh, how can we change API? How can we change uh, implementations and, and things like that uh, with, to prevent breaking, breaking people? So of course, this product AM is running on Kubernetes. Um, we have a quite big product. Uh, we are running on Azure, and we have uh, 37 or more clusters in production. Um, so we are present in multiple regions in the States, Europe, Australia, Singapore, Japan, India, and even more, more availability zones are coming. Um, and we have a dedicated team who is building and managing the infrastructure for us. So this is quite important for us because then we don't need to care about, you know, the low level stuff. We just use Kubernetes. So the AM environments. Customers can have multiple AM environments in our systems. So they can just go to the UI and then just click a button and then they just get as many environments as they want. Um, usually each customer has three or more Kubernetes namespaces because we use namespaces to divide customers as, to have customer isolation. So each environment in our case, we call it like it is a micro monolith. It's like a hybrid, right? We are always in the trending. If microservices are trending, we are there. If monoliths are trending, we are also there. So yeah. Mon monoliths are trending now more. Yeah, yeah, of course. It depends on the day. <laughs> It depends on the day. So we use namespaces to provide the scope, as I told you. So basically, we have network isolation. We also have control about the quotas and also permissions. And actually, permissions is re pretty related to our main topic, which is security. Because the problem is that, uh, well, the problem, the fact is that we are running customer code on our clusters. So then we need to take care about the security. This is a very important stuff. Services. So we are a big company. This is a big product. So we have multiple service, multiple teams um, building services here. So we have different requirements, different languages, Go, Java, you know, Bash, whatever, a lot. So the rule is that if you build it, then you run it and you drive it. And of course, we use also some internal contracts like APIs or Kubernetes operators patterns. So then we have like an agreement, internal agreement. And environments. Also, one thing that we use is init containers and cited containers in order to divide responsibilities and don't have conflicts, because that's the, the, main, the main problem about uh, monoliths. So then. Yeah, the sidecars is an interesting pattern in Kubernetes, where, which is very useful for kind of breaking the monolith into separate services, but you are not, you're running the services in the same box, in the same, uh, in the same uh, space of C groups, uh, networking, uh, and all. 
So we took this approach to start moving uh, some parts of the application th so they can be separate, the code can be deployed separately, different Docker images, different containers, isolation, and so on, but they run together with the, with the main application. We have a bunch of them, uh, service warm-up, storage initialization, we have a HTTPD service in front of the Java application, that this also comes from the time when, when people are running this on-premise. This is the typical setup. Uh, Sidecar to support metrics to our uh, uh, analytic systems. Fluent Bit as a sidecar to send the logs. Thread dump collection on Java. Uh, when the JVM stores a thread dump, we automatically get it and ship it. Uh, Envoy proxying. I'll talk a bit, a bit about this on the auto-updater. So the service warm-up is something for a big application on Java that takes a while to start. Uh, this will make sure that the, pa the paths that are being hit uh, by the users, the cache is already initialized. And because if you don't do this, when the pod comes up and the Java application comes up and you start getting requests, uh, this request may take a long time to be served because the cache is not initialized. And it does it, uh, it does lazy caching, it goes through the most requested paths and, and caches those, and this way we don't uh, need expensive starts. The other option would be at the startup say, okay, go and load everything in the cache, but then it takes you a, a longer time for the startup. Fluent Bit, open source solution to send the logs. Uh, we use a shared volume in a pod uh, but a separate container, application writes, uh, application and other sidecars write uh, logs to a specific location, and Fluent Bit we can configure it and deploy it separately and get those to, to get those logs and ship them. Envoy is a very popular uh, cloud native uh, proxy. We use this for tra traffic tunneling and routing. And in our use case, this allows us to have dedicated IPs per tenant and VPN connectivity from each uh, customer pod to each customer uh, endpoint, VPN, or, or giving them a specific IP without having to have uh, separate hardware or virtual hardware for them. We set up a sidecar, we uh, configure the Java JVM, to send the traffic to that sidecar, that sidecar is going to go and send it to another envoy that is outside the, outside the Kubernetes area, and that way it goes out to the internet or to the internal customer uh, network. The out of data is a solution that we came up with. Uh, you may have heard of some issue with Log4j some time ago, <laughs> right? Not, ve not very well known. If you work with Java, then you definitely heard about that. So how can we update Log4j across a fleet of thousands of tens of, tens of thousands of containers? One way is we rebuild all the Docker, all the container images, we redeploy everything. That would be one way. The other way is we run an init container, and this allows us to patch live the, the, the main container without having to touch the monolith. And uh, so when the monolith starts, the log4j is replaced. And this way, it's extensible, so we can replace any file we want. So operators. We use Kubernetes operators. Um, we have a main operator, uh, which actually is not open source. It's an internal one. But we want to introduce it because actually it's base is the main architecture that we have. So this operator is managing the life cycle of the environments. So actually it is an operator to room them all. So then we use other ones that I'll explain later. And what this operator does is we launch some pre and post jobs. And also we reconcile other internal uh, operators and also the environments. So then this is one of the operators that we reconcile. We use Flag CD Helm operator. This operator is used so then it allows us to manage um, the, the environment creation, the environment upgrades using Helm. 
It allows us to have a declarative way of you know, having all the information there in a Kubernetes uh, custom resource. And then we can quickly you know, use this information to, uh, for debugging so developers can just go. We have some internal tooling to, to get this information. So it is pretty simple to have like a straightforward way to, to get the status of the Helm. And also, um, it is also very important because we all have a way to automatically manage the status from the main operator. We also use or started to use Argo rollouts. So this is a thing that we just recently started to. Um, so we use it to provide an advanced way of having deployment strategies. This is pretty awesome. Um, we then have access to Canary, Blue, Green, AV testing, and more. But also, it allows us to have automated rollbacks. Yeah, and, and for the main, op the, the reason we have the main operator is also to have a, an API that other services can use, and we could replace in the future, we want to replace the Helm operator for something else, we can just do it. On the scaling part um, and optimizing resources, we talked about how this is a micro monolith, uh, as we like to call it. We have 17, more than 17,000 of these environments, uh, Java, main Java application uh, pod with sidecars and all. And uh, because we have them, these multiple teams building services, we are looking for ways to uh, scale that are orthogonal so that, we don't, that each service doesn't need to be aware of very specific things to do, but we can apply across the whole uh, fleet of clusters. On Kubernetes, you can have uh, resource requests and limits. Resor requests is basically uh, how many resources are warranted. Limits is how many resources you can consume. And you can overcommit. You can have limits uh, higher than requests. And these requests and limits are applied to CPU, memory, and ephemeral storage. On the memory side, uh, the limit is enforced and it results on the kernel OOM kill. For all of you Java developers, this is not related. This is separate from the JVM OOM exceptions that you may get. Uh, basically, if you go over the amount of memory that your uh, container is limited to, the kernel is going to kill your process. On the ephemeral storage part, the limit is enforced. And if you go over the limit of the storage that you're using, your pod is going to get evicted from that node and Kubernetes is going to schedule it somewhere else. An interesting Porsche part of this on the CPU side is how CPU requests and limits work. Um, for requests, yes, it's used for uh, scheduling. At the very beginning, you said, oh, I want to deploy this and have two CPUs. But then, uh, it's not really the number of CPUs that can be used. It's a relative weight uh, once the pod is running is, or the container is running on the node. It's a relative weight between all the containers running on the node. So one CPU means that it can consume one CPU cycle for each CPU period. So if you have two containers running on the same node, but they only request 0 0.1 CPUs, and there's nothing else running on that node, they can use up to 50% each. Uh, well, they can use up to 100%, but if both are using all the CPU they can, they will split the CPU on 50-50. So the request, once the container is running, is just a weight relative to other containers. For limits, uh, this, on Kubernetes, this translates to C groups, quota, and period. The period on the, on the kernel is by default 100 milliseconds, and the limit that you set in Kubernetes is how many CPU cycles can be used in a period. If you go over that limit, the container is throttled. This is important on applications that are multi-threaded, like typically Java, and you'll see it there uh, more often. So if, if your Java application in one thread is using, uh, sorry, if your Java application has four threads and they are using all CPU they can and the period is 100 milliseconds, in 25 milliseconds you already use all the CPU you could use in 100 milliseconds. So your container is going to be running for uh, 25 milliseconds and throttle doing nothing for 75 milliseconds. 
So this is very important, again, very multi-threaded applications like Java. The other thing we're using for scaling and cost uh, savings is uh, switching to ARM. Anybody using ARM? The, the people that are not using ARM, why? <laughs> so you get, uh, for, a, for our numbers, we are getting 15 to 25% cost savings for the same performance. And in Java, for instance, it's very easy because you have JVMs built for ARM uh, and you just have to change the base image for your containers and that's all. On the specific case of Java, um, Java was a bit picky running on containers for a long time. Now it's a, it's a lot better. But if you look at the um, defaults, if you have a JVM that uh, a container running with more than 5, 12 megabytes of, uh, of memory, the JVM by default is only going to use 25% as the heap size. So you're wasting 75% of the memory of the container if you just use the default. We typically use, and I think most cases, you can use 75% of the container memory unless you have uh, things that are off heap like Elasticsearch, Spark, any, any native code that you're calling. And the, on Kubernetes, the, the AVM, when it creates the, the heap, it uh, basically takes that memory. Kubernetes doesn't know how much of the heap is running, so you have to consider that. And for now, uh, for Java applications, typically, you, you would set uh, request and limits to the same value because, again, the JVM takes the heap size and it's going to be cons constant across the whole uh, time the, the container is running. So, perfect timing. Kubernetes autoscaling. We use autoscalers. Which ones? We use Kubernetes autoscaler, the horizontal pod one, and also the vertical one. So let's talk a little bit about them. The cluster of the scaler, well, you might know already, but this is to increase and reduce the cluster size. So we base this autoscaling on the CPU and memory requests. So um, this, is, this sentence actually is going to be quite important because I'll show you an example why. Don't forget to set a maximum of nodes when you, you are using the cluster autoscaler. You'll see. So using this cluster autoscaler, we have some savings around 30 and 50%. And here is the example why you should set this maximum of nodes. So you can see here a normal behavior, right? You can see we are going from 50 uh, instances up to, you know, uh, 100. But then, you can just decide and wake up one day and see this kind of bug. You can see that uh, suddenly the number of instances went up, right, straightforward, to 150. This was because we introduced a bug, then we realized about some alerting, hey, you are getting the maximum of nodes, and then we just fix it, and then you can see the behavior just start going down. Otherwise, the bill for that month would be very funny. We also use the vertical pod autoscaler. So just a little bit. I'll explain why. This is about decreasing and increasing the resources for each pod, so making it bigger or smaller. And the, the fact is that right now, at least in our Kubernetes version that we are using, it requires the restart of pods. Actually, this is one good thing that is going to change in future uh, Kubernetes versions that will avoid that. And actually, it will make it like, more interesting for us. So this vertical pod of the scaler, uh, we only use it in dev environments um, to scale it down if they are unused. That's why we just have a little savings, like 5 and um, 15%. And the horizontal pod autoscaler. Actually, this is one of the most interesting one, the ones for us. We create more pods when they are needed. So if we need more pods, then we create more. If we just have less traffic, then we create less. Well, we remove. <laughs> so uh, we scale this autoscaler on, based on CPU and HTTP requests per minute. So the thing is that don't use the same 
metric for the horizontal one and the vertical one, because otherwise you are going to have like some troubles. Um, CPU autoscaling only is problematic, and you can just think about this case. What happens for these periodic tasks that have like a high consumption of CPU on a startup or just, you, can, you know, because you have an, a spike? If you just base the horizontal pod autoscaler on this CPU a metric, then you might have the same trouble, but with a lot of pods that are unuseful. So then that's not something that you want to behave. So the thing is that we recommend you to, uh, you know, put something else, not only CPU, but also like request per minute or any other metric. Um, this is allowing us to have some savings around 50 and 75%, so which is a lot. Yeah, so to wrap it up, in our, or just giving us, uh, giving you the example of our experience, uh, I think it's very easy to start in Kubernetes, then optimize. You can start. It's very easy to do a lift and shift, bring your monolith or whatever application you have running somewhere else, bring it to Kubernetes, and then optimize with these patterns like sidecars or uh, starting with microservices as you need it. Uh, yeah, we use these patterns to decompose the application, sidecars in the containers, new services, microservices, whatever you want over time. And it's also important to consider the resource optimization, how you tune this JVM if you're doing Java, uh, how do you set up the CPU request limits, the memory, um, garbage collector on the JVM, the, all, these, all these things you can do afterwards. So if you have questions, we'll take, we have three minutes for questions. Otherwise, I'll bring Oleg here to give us more jokes. One question over there. Okay, so the question is, I'll have to repeat it, uh, summarizing the, how do we manage CPU autoscaling with thread groups on, especially on JVMs, right? Yeah, so I think we didn't go into detail there, but we had this issue, for instance, the uh, throttling. You create uh, multiple threads because your uh, JVM assumes it's running, especially on older versions of Java, assumes it's running with uh, the same CPUs that the host has or something like that. If you don't narrow it down to the limits you set in the container, it's going to think, oh, I have 32 CPUs. I'm going to create all these threads. And then your container doesn't have, maybe the limits are set to one CPU or two CPUs. And the container, um, J the JVM is going to create very big thread pools, is going to start using at the same time a lot of the CPU, and it's going to cause, you're going to see this as throttling in metrics in Kubernetes. Yeah, so you have to, um, we can go in detail later, but you have to consider how do you set the number of uh, CPUs that the JVM can see with the CPUs you limit the container to? And you have to figure out what's the right number for those things to match. And especially when you allow out the scaling to go. Uh, so if you have a container that can run with 10 CPUs or two CPUs based on dynamic uh, metrics, uh, you have to figure out uh, on a startup not have a static number of how many CPUs the JVM can see, but have a dynamic number based on those uh, requests and limits. Any other question, quick? Yes? Yeah, okay. 
So uh, do we depend uh, totally on the autoscaler or if we switch, um, or, or we, or we ha look at other metrics? Um, so we look at the, how busy the clusters are and when we see levels in, in regions, we create new clusters. That was the question about what, whether we create more clusters. We don't, yeah, we depend on, totally on the autoscaler for each cluster and when we reach the capacity, what we consider is the capacity of a cluster, we create more clusters. Well, thank you very much, thank you very much for having us. Yeah. Thank you.